To understand this better, let's think for a moment about the worker who deals with electric arcs all the time. That's right, a welder. Welders regulate current flow to produce different sizes of electric arcs, depending on the amount of heat needed for the metal to be welded. This simple concept of a small amount of current will produce a small amount of heat and a large amount of current will produce a large amount of heat is necessary for understanding fault current. Now let's take another lesson from the pipe fitters and plumbers. Airlines, water lines, and gas lines all have to be rated to withstand the pressures of their system or they would rupture or explode. Electrical systems have to be rated to withstand the large amounts of current flow created during a ground fault condition. The electrical withstand rating is called the amps interrupting capacity or rating. It may also be called the short circuit rating depending on the device or component being referred to in the electrical system. These numbers are usually in the thousands of amps category. When an engineer designs an electrical system, he calculates the fault current at each panel or disconnect to ensure that the components used are rated above the calculated values. Usually, there are several standard levels or categories of short circuit ratings present in most buildings. Let's take a closer look at the drawing and some of the interrupting capacity ratings of the panels and switchgear. On the left side of this drawing, we see the main service, which is rated for 65,000 amps of fault current. There are several factors that determine the actual fault currents and withstand ratings. And so, two seemingly similar panels can have completely different ratings. Like the two 200 amp 480 volt panels on the right. One has a 25,000 amp interrupting capacity rating, and the other a 42,000 amp interrupting capacity rating. It is not necessarily the size or voltage of a component that determines these values as small wires and fuses can have large fault currents due to their location in the system. Now let's consider how long the arc is present. As I mentioned earlier, the circuit breaker or fuse will require some time to sense the overcurrent condition and open the circuit. If we use a 60 hertz system, there are 60 cycles or complete sine waves every second. One tenth of a second equals six cycles. So when a fault occurs, some waveforms get through before the protective device opens the circuit. This number can range from as small as less than one cycle to more than 60 cycles or a one second clearing time. In this next video from Square D, I want you to notice just how large the ball of fire gets in just one cycle of the sine wave or one sixtieth of a second. Let's see what happens when the power is turned on. First, the real-time version. Now, a frame-by-frame -frame replay of the same shot. In this case, the metal shorting link was blown away from the side of the enclosure, and all three phases became involved. Remember, all within 17 one-thousandths of a second. Because of this danger, the 2002 National Electrical Code now requires arc flash labeling on all non-residential electrical equipment that is likely to require examination, adjustment, servicing, or maintenance while energized to warn qualified workers of potential electric arc flash hazards. Let's take a moment and go over the five factors that determine how much injury a worker will suffer if exposed to an electric arc flash. First, there is the amount of fault current available in the system. Then there is the length of time the arc is present and if it is in a box or enclosure that will direct the force. Finally, the distance from the arc and the type of clothing worn by the worker round out the list. This information is used to create the required warning label so any qualified worker can select the proper personal protective apparel before working on the equipment. This tag lists the flash protection boundary, the level of PPE required for arc flash, and the approach distances based on voltage. NFPA 70E has created voltage tables to help determine electrical shock hazard distances for both qualified and unqualified workers from exposed, energized electrical parts. The three boundaries specified are called the limited, restricted, and prohibited approach boundaries. Specific requirements for clothing, tools, and procedures are necessary to perform tasks in each of these spherical boundaries so a worker does not even have to be working on the energized component, just coming near it with a tool or a body part 
will trigger the need for these protective measures. If a detailed hazard analysis has not been completed or there are no labels on the equipment, there are tables found in NFPA 70E based on specific parameters that will help the workers select the proper personal protective equipment. All clothing, including undergarments, must be of natural fiber. Never wear clothing made from synthetic materials or blends with material like polyester or nylon unless it has been properly treated and tested. An ATPV rating or arc thermal performance value is used to determine the ability of a garment to withstand various arc flash intensities. There are five levels of hazard numbered from zero to four with four being the greatest or highest risk. Let's look at a series of tests on various types of clothing material that are subjected to arc flash levels that many employees face while performing their daily tasks. On the right we see a regular cotton polyester dress shirt. On the left a 100 percent cotton shirt. Now a cotton shirt on the left and an arc flash rated shirt on the right. This next video from ERI Safety emphasizes the need for proper arc flash protection. I was working second shift and had to rack out a 480 volt circuit breaker as part of a preventive maintenance procedure. Now according to the procedure I was supposed to wear a switching jacket and hood but since it was so hot and nobody was around to see I decided not to wear the hood. I had it with me I just didn't wear it. I had all the standard excuses. It was hot and uncomfortable, but I think the real reason was my attitude. It was a fairly new procedure, and I just didn't understand why I had to wear it, and I resented being made to do so. As I racked out the breaker, I knew something was wrong because I could hear an arcing noise coming from behind the breaker. I figured if I could rack it back in, it would be okay, but I guess I wasn't fast enough. By not wearing the blast helmet, his head and neck were left unprotected. I must have managed to close my eyes and look away right before it blew. That's the only reason I'm not blind. What's amazing to me is still, after my incident, there's still people that won't wear the jacket and hood. Listen, when the work is done, the hood can come off, but these scars, they never will. The message is clear. Protect your employees and yourself. Don't wait for an accident to happen.